Uh, so yeah, I'd like to tell you guys how to construct non-malleable codes against bounded polynomial time tampering. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Donna Dockman Soled and Makul Kulkarni, who are at uh, UMD, uh, Rachel Lin at uh, University of Washington now, and Tal Malkin, who is my advisor. Um, so, right. Uh, non malleable codes were introduced a number of years ago uh, by Jambowski, Pietrek, and Weeks. Um, with the application in mind of uh, you want to, you're concerned about uh, someone tampering with uh, memory, basically. Okay, so you want to encode some information such that it's resilient to tampering attacks. And the example I like to keep in mind is sort of like related key attacks. You're worried about uh, you have some value and you're worried about someone, say, adding one to it or flipping a bit or setting a bit to zero. And you want to prevent these sorts of things from happening. Um, and right, we're in the public setting. You don't want to protect your key with another key or something like this, okay? So, right, what sort of guarantees informally do we want this uh, non malleable code to have? Uh, correctness, right? Uh, if no tampering occurs, we should be able to re recover the original value, of course. And we want some notion of security. So, security here is going to mean that uh, if tampering does occur, that you either recover exactly what you started with or something that's completely unrelated. And which of these two cases you're in shouldn't depend on the information that you started with either, okay? Um, so, how do we, how do they formalize this? Uh, they formalize this in sort of a real ideal paradigm. Um, where for any tampering function f, we should be able to simulate this tampering, okay? So the simulator is not going to, it's just going to flip some coins and it's going to output something. It will either output a message like x or it will output this special symbol same, okay? And uh, to argue security, what we want to say is that if we wrap this simulator, for any x, if we wrap this simulator such that the same symbol is mapped to x, then we want the, the, the real experiment and this uh, simulated experiment uh, are indistinguishable. So right, the simulator is independent of the message, but this guarantee should hold for all messages, okay? And most of the time, this notion of indistinguishability is considered to be uh, statistical, uh, but all computational notions have uh, also been considered, and uh, that's what we're going to focus on here, uh, at least later on, okay? So the goal in uh, non malleable codes is to construct, is this like all coding theory, we want explicit constructions where you can encode and decode efficiently for robust tampering classes, okay? You can't handle arbitrary tampering. Uh, some things that have been considered are split state, you'll hear about some of this later today, uh, small depth circuit tampering, some base bounded tampering, a variety of other examples, okay? But as cryptographers, what would we like? We would like to uh, handle any efficient tampering procedure, okay? So is this possible? Unfortunately, no. Uh, if we require additionally that our encoding and decoding are efficient. Um, this is a simple attack, right? So if uh, I can always decode the message, say add one to it or whatever you want, and then re-encode it, okay? If the encoding and decoding are efficient, then this tampering function is also efficient. Okay, so we can't handle arbitrary polynomial time tampering with some fixed polynomial time code. It's very different from the normal case in uh, cryptography, okay? But if we bound the tampering function, then we can hope to make progress, and we can simply have encode and decode be more, take more time than, uh, than, uh, tampering, than the tampering that we're preventing, okay? So if we fix some constant C, and we're concerned with now with the uh, function f that's computable in time and to the C. Okay, so is this possible? So yes, in this original paper, Zimbabwe, Pietrick, and Weeks uh, show that these codes exist using the probabilistic method. Okay, but this construction is not efficient. Later work, uh, Charakchi and Gurshwami, four years later, uh, showed uh, efficient probabilistic construction. So they basically de-randomize uh, probabilistic construction and show that uh, also this, this, code, this code can be computed efficiently, decoded and uh, uh, encoded and decoded efficiently. Moreover, it's, they give like an algorithm that will flip coins and output a code, and with high probability, this code is good, okay? Uh, Faust et al, at the, around the same time, gave another construction uh, with, in the CRS model, okay? So both of these results, uh, actually, before I continue, I'd like to say, though, that the CRS Whereas, like, most of the time uh, we think of this as a good thing, and in fact, this construction is highly non-trivial. 
Uh, unfortunately, it's an untamperable component in their scheme. And the length of the CRS is, in fact, large. The CRS is larger than the circuits that we're actually bounding against. So the circuit can't even depend on the entire CRS. Um, but on the other hand, these results are pretty powerful. They are actually with respect to not just bounded polynomial uniform time, but non-uniform tampering procedures. And so there's sort of like not a lot of hope of doing anything uh, explicitly here without some assumptions, at least. Uh, because it would basically immediately imply a very strong circuit lower bounds. Okay. So, but we still can ask this question. Is it possible to develop a non malleable code for bounded polynomial time tampering without a CRS? And we answer this in the affirmative, uh, conditioned on some assumptions. Okay. So, let's go through these assumptions first. So first assumption is the assumption from the de-randomization literature that I will elaborate on in a moment. Second, we assume trapdoor permutations, sub-exponentially secure, uh, which uh, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with. And uh, third, we assume something called a P-certificate, which is maybe less of you are familiar with. Okay, and assuming all of these things, uh, if we have this theorem that says, if assuming these things, instantiations of these objects, you get an explicit, efficient, non malleable code that uh, holds for against uh, any uniform end to the C time tampering with inverse polynomial indistinguishability. Okay, so what does this, what does this little uh, thing at the bottom mean? It means that, uh, that for any non uniform dis poly size distinguisher, uh, the, the, the gap uh, here is inverse polynomial, not negligible, unfortunately. It would be great if we could do better, but this is what we have. Okay. We already think it's very exciting. Okay, so P certificates. What is a P certificate? I'm assuming not all of you know what this is. Uh, it's a non interactive argument system for any statement in P, such that the runtime of the verifier and the proof length are independent, uh, are bounded by some fixed polynomial, independent of the language which, you care, which you're proving some statement about. Okay? So CS proofs. Uh, Macaulay's CS proofs imply P certificates. Um, the key thing here, though, is P certificates are a falsifiable assumption. Okay. Uh, the other sort of assumption, which is maybe less familiar to uh, this audience, is uh, de-randomization assumption. So what do we mean by this exactly? We mean assumptions of the form E, which is the class of uh, exponential time, uh, things that languages that can be decided in exponential time, does not have X, where X is some type, X type of circuits, uh, uh, of size 2 to the beta n, where beta is some, some constant, OK? So right, there's, we're going to, there's various assumptions of this form if you, depending on how you fill in this X, OK? So uh, de-randomization, uh, just a brief history. In the 80s, Yao. Uh, showed that uh, cryptographic PRGs are sufficient not just for privacy purposes, but for simulating, deterministically simulating uh, randomized algorithms. Nissan Victorson sort of observed that these cryptographic PRGs are too strong. Like they work on uh, arbitrary uh, polytime algorithms, uh, and they have uh, very strong indistinguishability guarantees, uh, negligibly indistinguishable, and you can relax both of these things. Uh, and they showed that if you relax both of these things, uh, if you have just a hard on average function for circuits, you can de randomize. Okay. And later, it was shown that uh, you don't actually need this hard on average, you can actually start from a worst case assumption. In particular, this assumption at the top, where x is just normal, your standard circuits. Okay. And this was sufficient to de randomize BPP. Okay, these assumptions have appeared in lots of work, de-randomizing all sorts of things. Um, but uh, but before we before we continue, I'd like to so uh, this prior non malleable codes that I was just discussing, we can view as partial de-randomizations of a randomized construction. So assuming run right, and they imply like if you want an explicit code, you need circuit lower bounds. So 
if we assume circuit lower bounds, then can we hope to make progress? Unfortunately, we don't know. Uh, unfortunately, the case of like de-randomizing these randomized uh, code constructions is very different from uh, de-randomizing uh, languages, at least uh, to our knowledge. Um, so this work, I guess you could view it as a partially positive answer, but right, I'd like to reiterate that it's very different in that we're considering uniform tampering functions. And uh, it's also different from the prior work in that uh, our guarantees are computational and uh, non-negligible. Okay. But, okay, so returning to de-randomization assumptions, these assumptions have applications beyond uh, simply de-randomizing things. So Barack uh, and others showed that uh, if you have instantiate X with uh, co-non-deterministic circuits, then uh, with trapdoor permutations, you can have one message witness indistinguishable proofs for NP. If you combine this assumption with one-way functions, you can get bit non-interactive bit commitment. Uh, Applebaum and others showed that uh, if you instantiate this X with uh, non-deterministic circuits, you can create uh, polytime computable incompressible functions for uh, the class of n to the c size circuits. Okay. So what is an incompressible function? An incompressible function is basically for c if, uh, for the purposes of this talk, we'll use this definition, if I shrink my input by half, any efficient procedure for shrinking the input by half will be completely correlated, uncorrelated with this function psi. Okay, so psi is an un incompressible function in this case. Right? This notion was developed by Dubrovishai. Okay, we're actually going to use all of the results in this slide uh, in our result. So in this work, we show that, uh, that if E does not have NP circuits, so what is an NP circuit? This is a circuit with SAT gates, which can use, uh, has access to a SAT oracle. Uh, this is the assumption we use, and along the way we show that uh, if you combine this with sub-exponentially secure one-way functions, you can get uh, non what we call non-interactive, quasi-non-malleable bit commitments. Okay. So I've already introduced way too many notions than I should in uh, 10 minutes, but roughly what is this, this object up here? It's, uh, you can think of it as a non-malleable code that cannot be decoded efficiently in a very strong sense, right? Uh, it's a commitment, so it has this hiding property. You can't get any information efficiently. Okay. Um, but for those that are in the know, uh, quasi, quasi here, this is a standard non-interactive, non-malleable commitment, except that we're restricting uh, the adversary in this way that's consistent with what I've been talking about. The man in the middle in, is going to be less powerful than uh, the committer and uh, uh, the receiver. Okay, and why are we considering this? Why are we considering this? Uh, uh, relaxed notion, um, basically because we want, we already have too many assumptions. We don't, we want to avoid uh, time lock puzzles or hardness amplifiable one way functions. Okay, but returning to our main result, uh, if I have time, I'll say something about this, but I probably won't. Uh, so returning to our main result, uh, how, how, do we, how do we achieve, prove this theorem? Okay, so our starting point is a framework of ours from a year ago at Eurocrypt, uh, where, um, we want, we're showing, we want to show how to, we wanted to show how to take an average case hardness for some complexity class and combine it with some crypto and get out a non malleable code for the same complexity class with a CRS. Okay. How does this work? So we're going to use the nor young paradigm. So we're going to encode, so say we want to encode a bit B. We're going to give two encodings. One is going to be a random input that this psi, which is our hard function for this class C, uh, such that psi of x equals b, the bit that we want to encode. Okay, psi is the hard function. C is going to be a public key encryption of the bit b under some public key. Uh, right, this, we want to also, we're also going to need this property that uh, you can decrypt using the secret key within this complexity class. And finally, we want, uh, we're going to attach a proof, like in Snor Young, that say that c and x uh, are encodings of the same value. Uh, Okay. This also should have very efficient verification. Okay. So our CRS is this public key, the NISIC in this CR, the NISIC CRS. And to decode, right, remember, like, even though we're using crypto, there's no secrets, right? It's a code. There's, everything is public. So to decode, we're going to simply verify the proof 
using the CRS. And then we're going to evaluate psi on x. Okay. So how do we prove that this is non-malleable code? Uh, we're going to prove something slightly stronger than our normal non-malleability, but uh, for, ignore it for now. But you're gonna, so let me sketch the hybrid argument. So we have on the left uh, an encoding of 0, and on the right an encoding of 1, or the experiments, the whole experiment. Okay. So first, we're going to switch to simulated proofs using the zero-knowledge property of the NISIC. Then we use semantic security to you know, switch to uh, dummy encryptions. So then we apply simulation soundness, and we're going to apply simulation soundness to switch to a special alternate form of decoding, which is very low complexity. So using this secret key, where you can decode very efficiently by simply decoding from the CRA, decrypting this, the ciphertext. Okay, simulation soundness guarantees that this is okay. It won't change the, the distribution. Output distribution, and now we have that. If we look at this, we can define this. Uh, we can look at these experiments and define this class of circuits that take in this input x, and this is in this low complexity class C. And because of that, we can argue, we can deduce from the hardness of psi that uh, these two things have to be indistinguishable. Okay, great. But there's still a CRS here, which is not ideal. And both of these elements of the CRS seem very integral. One, this first piece, this public key, we need this for this special trapdoor decoding, right? There shouldn't be a way to get, there can't be a way to get around this, basically. And two, uh, this NISIC, NISICs without CRSs are strictly impossible. So what are we going to do? Well, let's, let's focus on the first piece. So recall that we, we need some sort of trapdoor decoding. So what can we do? The idea here is to suppose that psi is not just hard on average, but instead is incompressible, like I said before. If you try to compress it to, say, half the length, then what you get is statistically completely, like, not completely, but statistically uncorrelated with what you started with, or at least with the, the correct value of psi. Okay? So if we assume that our ciphertext is very short, then we can hope then it's infeasible for any efficient procedure to simply output this ciphertext, given x, okay? It's to output any correlated ciphertext, okay? So, first thing we're going to do is rather than use a, a public key encryption, we're going to switch to just a statistically binding commitment, okay? So, and then if we look at this sort of uh, penultimate hybrid in the middle of the slide, and we blow it up, instead of the alternate decoding procedure from before, we're going to have this uh, two-phase alternate decoding. First, we're going to verify the proof, and then we're simply going to output the tampered uh, ciphertext that we received. And then the second phase is going to be extract from this uh, tampered uh, commitment. Okay? So the first part, the top phase, if we consider the experiment up to the using just the first part of the decoding, this is going to have low complexity. And it's going to take in this long input x and output a short ciphertext, which is great, because this is exactly the situation we need. The second part is inefficient, but because these guarantees are statistical, we don't care, actually. So it's enough to argue indistinguishability already here, just from incompressibility. Okay, so great. We took care of one aspect, but we still have this NISIC CRS. Um, so, right, NISIC without CRS is impossible, but this is for non-uniform provers. So, if, because we're considering this uh, uniform tampering setting, there's some hope. And in fact, uh, an older paper from Barack and Raphael Pass, uh, they they considered exactly this notion. They showed that uh, you can construct these things. They called one message zero knowledge proofs. This is a NISIC without a CRS with uh, guarantees against uniform adversaries. And what, it's not too difficult to deduce that uh, using uh, some of these, uh, another result I mentioned before, and uh, this uh, FLS framework, that uh, the assumptions that uh, we're using, one, two, and three, are enough to uh, instantiate these uh, one message zero knowledge proofs. The problem is, if you recall, we don't need just zero knowledge. We still need simulation soundness. But that's not entirely true, uh, because right, we're in this very specific setting where 
the, uh, we're just tempering using a relatively efficient tempering uh, function. And so our solution is that, uh, well, OK. So our solution is to, first of all, replace this, uh, this uh, commitment with a non-malleable commitment. This will basically guarantee, this will give us the same guarantees that simulation soundness was giving us before. OK? And the second is from the second observation that uh, we don't need this really strong notion of simulation soundness. We don't need to hold our, we don't care about like arbitrary attacks, where all of our attacks are of, of a very specific form. Given this uh, simulated proof, you know, you can mallet very efficient, like in n to the c time, to get another proof. So this notion of quasi non malleable commitment is, in fact, sufficient for our purposes. OK. So uh, just to back up, uh, we show that uh, assuming E is hard for exponential size NP circuits, uh, assuming also trapdoor permutations that are sub-exponentially secure, and P certificates, we can construct efficient non malleable codes for bounded polynomial time tempering. And along the way, we uh, construct uh, non-interactive, non uh, quasi non-malleable commitments and uh, show some other connections to complexity theory that hopefully you all will find interesting. Um, and I'll end there. Yeah, yes. That's, yes. Yes, yes. The problem is like detecting like whether a code is good or not is, uh, is hard. But, OK. You. No, no. That's the that's the that's the big that's the big difference. So you can't just like yeah, like in a language you can take majority or something like this. Here, you know, you don't you don't you don't exactly, exactly, exactly. So any any other questions? Yes. So Chirakji and Guru Swami you mentioned had a result that did not use C R S, right? Sorry? Chirakchi and Guru Swami, you mentioned, had a result that did not use CRS and had a non-malleable code in the same model. This was shown in one of your... In the early slide? In, in the initial slides, yeah. Uh, yeah, but again, it's, uh, it's not so different because it's, a, it's, a, it's not a fully explicit construction. All they show is a sort of Monte Carlo-style procedure that with high probability outputs a good code. But you can't really put your finger on which one is, uh, whether a code is good or not. So with overwhelming probability, it's good, but, uh, you know, it's still not, uh, it's, you still don't know. And as you can view the CRS as sort of, uh, is, is a similar setting, right? Uh, you fix a CRS, it will be a good code. Um, but. Any other questions? If not, I ask one. What's yeah. the rate of your code? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, some fixed polynomial. Okay. <laughs> then, like uh, you said, so you work for uniform and to like bounded polynomial time and with inverse polynomial. Do you think you can get negligible error or go to non-uniform? That's a very good question. Oh, uh, you think it's doable or is there some barrier? The barriers, I would, I think, are so, for example, this incompressibility. Benny can probably speak more to this, but uh, the incompressibility is only the, the barrier. The reason it's only polynomial is because of the incompressibility only gives you polynomial uh, distance guarantees. So I don't, you would need to probably, at least following this framework, you would need to probably improve that before. Uh, um, do you think we can prove it's impossible to do it, or not really? I don't know. It's a okay. good question.
Yeah. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. You may be correct. <laughs> okay, so if no questions, let's thank the speaker again.